We are partners with the three public library districts for the Northern Kentucky Forum, which is designed to uh, talk about uh, public affairs in a civil, civic manner. Uh, and this particular forum on Farm to Table uh, has a bit of a history. We've been trying to do it for three years. So uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, 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 this little pandemic thing got in the way, and, uh, uh, but uh, it's an important topic. And I think you're in for a treat tonight. This is a fantastic uh, uh, panel with a lot of uh, experience in this field. And uh, so uh, I think we'll enjoy uh, hearing uh, from them. We are taping tonight, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, uh, we're not uh, simulcasting, which we have done some, at some points during the high, uh, pandemic. Often we were simply on Zoom with uh, that sort of audience. And, but we've also tried the hybrid uh, models. But we wanted to try tonight. Uh, uh, to get uh, back in person as much as we can. So appreciate you coming and supporting uh, the forum. Uh, our next uh, forum is, I think, October the 18th. Uh, we're finalizing some things on that, but it'll be a judicial forum with the candidates from uh, the State Supreme Court and Court of Appeals for Northern Kentucky, uh, and it'll be in the digitorium uh, on the campus of NKU. So uh, uh, watch for that. Um, the, um, uh, you have question cards, and if you don't, raise your hand and we'll give you one. You will have an opportunity uh, uh, to as you fill that out and just let uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, crew know. Uh, they'll uh, get, collect those cards and get them to me, and we'll take questions from the audience uh, toward the uh, end of the, the evening. Um, our guests have brought some uh, handouts uh, for you on the table. Uh, I have to say that uh, Dave Wilcox, um, uh, from Baker's Table brought bread, freshly baked in an Italian oven. I'm fresh, I say fresh for all, I know it's a year old, but uh, I don't think so. 9 a.m. Uh, this morning. 9 a.m. this morning, that's it. So, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's a good thing to go home with. They're uh, all gone. They're all gone, so uh, you, you have to find somebody to share with. Um, we uh, are going to uh, talk tonight about uh, the movement of farm to table, and uh, which is, um, I think it's fair to say, but I'll let the panelists uh, talk about it in more detail. It's been something that's been talked about for a, a while uh, and uh, movements made, but there, it seems to be getting a lot of momentum uh, right now. I want to just read to get, get us started a passage from uh, uh, bringing to the table a Wendell Berry book of uh, essays uh, on this topic. Um, uh, and uh, that I think will help set uh, uh, kind of the, the t tone for this e evening. And uh, unsimplification is difficult, I imagine, in any circumstance. Our present circumstances will make it especially so. Soon the majority of the world's people will be living in cities. We are now obligated to think of so many people demanding the means of life from the land to which they will no longer have a practical connection and which they will have little knowledge. So how do we accomplish this? How do, can we restore a competent husbandry to the minds of the world's producers and consumers? For a start, of course, we must recognize that this effort is already in progress on many farms and in many urban consumer groups scattered across the country and the world. But we must recognize, too, that this effort needs an authorizing focus and force that would grant it a new legitimacy, intellectual rigor, scientific respectability, and responsible teaching. So that uh, is, this was published in 2009. We're, uh, what, 13 years beyond that uh, uh, now. Uh, but you can, I think, see that uh, that, that is the challenge that we face. Uh, and you know, we're talking about uh, farm food on the table in a very urban setting in uh, Newport. So I think we can relate to what Mr. Berry uh, is telling us. And, um, uh, so uh, with that, I'm, we're going to just start. Uh, 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 Keith, if you don't mind, we're just going to go down the table and let uh, these folks introduce themselves and tell you a little bit, bit about uh, what they're doing and what their organizations are doing. You should have a handout that has information from their websites, but let's hear it uh, more personally. Okay. Thank you, Mark. My name is Keith Rogers. I'm Chief of Staff at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture for Commissioner of Agriculture Ryan Quarles. Uh, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture uh, is a, a, a consumer service organization. Uh, not only do we promote and, and work on policies to protect and promote agriculture across the state of Kentucky, 
but we also are a regulatory agency and touch many of you, all of you, basically every day. We are the ones who regulate gas pumps. We regulate scales. We also regulate pesticides, Orkin, all of the uh, uh, structural pesticides uh, also, along with our marketing. We have the Office of State Veterinarian in our department, uh, which oversees and works to protect disease outbreaks in our livestock sector across Kentucky. And so uh, we like to say that we touch every Kentucky one, at least once every day, and in most cases more than, more than once. But uh, we're a staff of just over 200 uh, individuals across uh, the state of Kentucky. As it relates to tonight's topic, uh, our Office of Marketing uh, does the, the most of the promotion uh, through uh, our work. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, have heard of Kentucky Proud. Uh, Kentucky Proud is one of our programs that is now just over 20 years old and it is one of the most recognized awarded programs in the United States of its kind. Most states have some sort of promotional program uh, for their agricultural uh, sector and uh, Kentucky's is probably now becoming one of the oldest and one of the most recognized. We've invested nearly 20 million dollars in just over 20 years in its promotion, advertising and everything else uh, that goes along to build that brand and that's what it's become as a brand that we're very proud of and I'll be glad to answer any questions about that as we go. Thank you Mark. Uh, ben Aquilar. Uh, very good to be with you all here in actual northern Kentucky. Uh, we're from Henry County. We say we're in northern Kentucky. Good to be in the in the real deal here. Um, I'm with the Berry Center. We're an agricultural nonprofit based in Henry County, Newcastle, Kentucky, about an hour southwest of here. Um, we advocate for farmers, land conserving communities, and healthy regional economies. Uh, the bulk of our work is based around the premise that, um, in particular, since the collapse of the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative Association um, from its high point in the 70s and 80s until now, we have seen a hollowing out of the farm economy in this state and across the country. Um, Kentucky has more small farms than any other state uh, in the Union. Um, we're also losing them faster than anyone else. Uh, and the shape of farming has changed substantially um, in the years since. Farms are getting larger, um, uh, controlled by conglomerate, uh, industrial farming operations has increased substantially and we think that that's to the great detriment of the rural places of this state in particular and because it's damaging to the rural places it is damaging to the urban places that eat from the rural places. Um, our work uh, centered around four different program areas which I'll go into more depth on later if you like. Um, we host the archive of the Berry Center. Uh, we have a sort of agricultural policy history of agriculture in our region. Um, we have the Agrarian Culture Center and Bookstore, where we host reading programs, uh, cultural events, things like that. We have the Wendell Berry Farming Program of Sterling College, where we teach a tuition-free, full-time, intensive farming education uh, in Henry County. And we have Our Home Place Meet, which is probably most relevant to the conversation tonight, which is a sort of nascent cooperative uh, based around beef production in the Henry County area. Um, all very exciting, and I could do two hours on each of them, but I won't. So, um, very happy to be with you all. Thank you. Uh, Anna Haas is uh, from the Local Food Connection, which also has a catchier name, but the stage is yours. <laughs> Good. So, Local Food Connection is a department uh, within a company called What Chefs Want. Sometimes What Chefs Want has been called Creation Gardens. That was its <laughs> original name. So, we, we joke that I've got three names that I juggle and don't always juggle very well. Um, I wanted to give you a little picture of, of what my days look like and what I do, and, and I think it's complicated. David here doesn't, doesn't think so, so you can tell me <laughs> afterwards if, if I made sense. But So if after tonight you were to look around town and look at the trucks traveling around, you will see Cisco trucks, and you will see Gordon Food Service trucks, and you will see U.S. Foods trucks, and you'll see some other large ones too. And so those are generally called broadliners in the food industry. And then you'll see some red trucks that say what chefs want. You'll see some white trucks that say Piazza Produce. You'll see, I think, Chef's Warehouse's white trucks. Um, and you'll see some other specialty food distributors like that. And all of the ones above tend to have pretty big warehouses. They have semis, they have big trucks, um, and they buy from lots of different places, too. What you might not notice as often is that sometimes you'll see sprinter vans. And so those are those smaller trucks, often refrigerated. 
Um, you'll see cars that you may not know have coolers with local food traveling around in them safely, um, but, but traveling. So there's, there's really a small food distribution system that, that is happening out there as well as the large one. So I used to be part of that small food distribution system, and I still am, and now I'm part of the large one too. So um, I worked at a farm called Turner Farm just briefly. I'm a terrible farmer. I, I liked food, and so I wanted to learn about organic growing, and I was awful. Um, but I, I'm a systems thinker, and I was excited to know, to know more. And so I happened to be doing that just around the time of uh, 2015 and 2016 when a woman named Elise Chalmers, who was a local food advocate, was starting a food hub. So she bought a refrigerated Sprinter van and started taking uh, food in and picking it up from local farms and selling it to local restaurants and it kept getting bigger and bigger and we got so I joined her within the first six months and I drove the truck not a great uh, delivery driver I have a hernia from it either um, but I kept I kept working that and we all kept working on it and so then we started selling to Cincinnati public schools <laughs> and then it got bigger and we started going into Columbus and then we were going in down into Louisville and Lexington and it was getting bigger and we had uh, five refrigerator vans a tiny little warehouse that we were out of space on and we thought what are we going to do um, so we ended up becoming part of this bigger company that's one of those bigger vans around town and trying to just have our local food come in still from small farms as well as medium-sized ones and working with some bigger ones and to try to make the small food system start working within the large food system. So um, I still work about a third of my time with farmers and producers and try to listen to them and help them understand how to make some steps forward to meet their goals. I work with chefs and, and people who buy food um, from some of the biggest schools and universities and places like Aramark down to <coughs> small farm to table restaurants and, and try to hear what they need and strategize how to get that. And then I try to also attend as many meetings as I can with places like Kentucky Department of Agriculture or um, school districts and, and thinkers to try to talk about how to, how to keep moving this uh, movement forward. So that's, that's what I do and hopefully that made, made okay sense. <laughs> All right, and David Wilcox has the Baker's Table, uh, not too far from here, and the Baker's Table Bakery, I mean, uh, but... Uh, 100%. Uh, oh, and also the best bandana on stage. Uh, <laughs> these are available for purchase at the... Uh, is that true, or is that a one sir. of a kind? 100%, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of bandana uh, envy in the room. So. That's, very, that's very generous of you, thank you. Uh, yeah, hello, friends. Thanks for coming out, appreciate you. Uh, yeah, I run a restaurant called The Baker's Table. Um, moved here from California seven years ago. In California, if you're a hot restaurant and you're not going to the farmer's market, you're not a hot restaurant. Um, it's pretty much the way that everyone did things there. Um, chefs were going to the market five days a week. Um, the menus changed all the time. People were connected. It was the, you know, it's where Chez Panisse is. It's the home of the farm to table cuisine movement. Alice Waters uh, is kind of my hero with that. So I moved out here. That was the food I was used to cooking. Um, didn't see it around, so I decided I would do it here. So we opened a restaurant in Newport, because I bought a house in Newport. And uh, we were lucky, we got a national award, two national awards our first year. And um, you know, the, the concept was simple. It's called the Baker's Table. We have a, an antique table that we purchased from a baker in Anderson Township. The idea was, uh, what if we make 100% of our bread? What if we just don't buy bread from anyone? And what if we only source produce from local farmers? That's what makes me excited as a cook. That's what I, th I feel like a lot of people want as consumers. I think they want quality, they want connection. And so my job is to sort of make weird things like rutabagas and turnip greens and uh, stuff that people don't usually eat uh, palatable and make that feel beautiful. And um, yeah, so we opened a bakery this year, Baker's Table Bakery. The reason is because, yeah, we made our own bread, but. Our facilities weren't good for that. So we opened a bakery across the street. So uh, yeah, we make bread. We do uh, pizza with farm ingredients. And uh, that's pretty much what we do. And I, I will add, just because I think that what they do is really wonderful, just to, you know, when I'm starting my restaurant, you know, where do you buy farm produce? How do you meet farmers? How do you, what they did was they went out and they met all these farmers and they catalog everything that they're growing on a weekly basis and they make it so me as a chef can can know this week I can get jalapenos but next week I can get this and this week I can get so they she's very much under 
underplaying what it is that they do. They've created a system where me as a, a restaurateur can access what hundreds of farmers are doing on a weekly basis and they organize it and they make it so I can get it. That's a very short description of what that is, but that's a huge resource, by the way. So cheers to you. Thank you, and uh, <laughs> Tiffany, uh, Tiffany uh, uh, is in charge of the uh, Fort Thomas uh, uh, Farmer's Market, uh, which you can visit every Wednesday at yes. uh, three o'clock. If you're of a certain age, you can come at 245 for senior shopping, uh, uh, no cheating. Uh, and uh, 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 starting in March and going through mid-December, so. Yes, yeah, we are a three season market. So um, our summer season that we're in right now, yes, we have corn and tomatoes right now. It's, we get that question starting in about March when we open. Um, but because we source everything from um, within a 60 mile radius of Fort Thomas, um, and no, you cannot buy locally grown corn and tomatoes in um, at least outside um, in uh, March. So um, my name is Tiffany Tomio and I run the Fort Thomas Farmers Market. Um, we have been established uh, for about 13 years now and I have the privilege of working with about 35 farmers and vendors um, who source products. Um, our guidelines for our particular market are um, within a 60 mile radius so that does include here across uh, right across the river in Ohio but also um, within the state of Kentucky. So um, we are very proud that our guidelines are really supporting our Kentucky farmers. Um, we, our job that we feel is to educate our, the consumers. Um, so there's a piece of what David does that is um, serving his serving the food. And what we're able to do is then help customers know how to access that food and learn how to cook it for themselves. Um, and so we believe that education is a huge piece of that. Um, and so we are working very hard to create programs at the farmer's market that are accessible to customers um, so that it's an, an easy place to come and visit. Um, one of the things that's nice about our particular market being on Wednesdays is it's not conflicting with soccer schedules <laughs> and um, dance competitions and things like that. And it's an easy place to stop on your way home um, after you pick up the kids from school. And um, so we're very, we're working very hard to educate the people in the Fort Thomas community and out outside of um, Fort Thomas and just the Northern Kentucky area generally on how you can access the local foods, what's in season, um, and what's the best way to prepare this because what anyone up here on this table can tell you is that as soon as you pick produce, um, it begins to lose its nutritional value. And so the farmer's market is a way to connect our farmers locally to the customers, um, not only providing produce that tastes better, but also has a higher nutritional value. Um, which is really important as we are looking at a lot of food insecurity in our communities. Um, it's really important that we find ways to connect people with the food that is going to serve them the best. And so at the farmer's market, um, whether it's our farmer's market or any of the farmer's markets, there are quite a few around us. In fact, um, Kentucky has a huge number of farmer's markets. Um, we're, that is what all of us as a community, a farmer's market community, are working on doing is making that accessible. Um, and then also one of my favorite things that we got to do with um, Campbell County Extension this year was um, we were able to go into one of the elementary schools and help them facilitate um, a garden project and then they were able to bring their herbs and things that they grew um, to the farmers market and it was just a really neat way to um, connect with those the younger generation um, because as our farms are struggling um, and as we're watching the climate change happen it's really important that we as consumers are supporting our farmers um, and the best way to do that is to directly purchase from them as much as you possibly can and so the farmers market is the way that we're able to um, facilitate those relationships so that's what I get to do thank you and Jed uh, Portman is with 80 acres uh, uh, I'm actually not sure how old the business is it feels new and the announcement that uh, of uh, uh, plans for the Boone County installation yeah. makes it feel even more new but uh, fill us in and uh, the bandana is probably best but uh, people like the hat too and uh, Ben was <laughs> Uh, 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 yeah, there was good, good advice to wear it, right? So. so, my name is Jed Portman. I'm a former magazine food editor who fell in love with the tomato about a year and a half ago. I like to say that 80 Acres Tomatoes are the only good supermarket tomatoes I've ever tasted that I've tasted. So I fell in love with this tomato before I knew anything else about it. Excited, right? I'm, I was sort of a local food snob. I didn't eat tomatoes out of season. Then I tasted this tomato that was just as good as what we were getting out of our garden at the height of the summer. So 
I reached out to the company, I learned a little bit, and I'll tell you what I found out. So you're right, 80 Acres has not been around for very long. Uh, our company was founded in 2015. We built our first brick and mortar farm, production farm, here in Cincinnati in 2017. So only five years ago. But things move quickly in our industry. Um, we are growing very quickly. So we now have five production facilities in southwestern Ohio, three R&D facilities in other parts of the country. And we've announced this year two new farms in Kentucky and Georgia uh, that are really like seven new farms. Uh, the brand new state-of-the-art farm that we opened about a year ago, this Kentucky farm is three times the size and grows a little over three times as much produce. The Georgia farm is about three times the size and grows about four times as much produce. So we're now in more than 300 produce stores, uh, mostly in the Midwest and Kentucky. A number of independent retailers in the area, Georgia Jones, uh, Georgia Maine. So we are growing entirely indoors, year-round. Greens, microgreens, tomatoes, cucumbers, and strawberries. We've been growing strawberries at a commercial scale for about a year now. We have very high standards. I think we accidentally set the bar high when we release these tomatoes. Everything else now has to be as good as those tomatoes. So when I first tasted uh, these strawberries that we were growing about a year ago, I said, it's a good strawberry. It's fine. It tastes like Driscoll's. No, not good enough. So we're finally releasing our 80 acre strawberries in October, which is a big step forward for us. We've gotten to the point where we think they're every bit as good as the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But we're excited to be finally, right, after five long years, crossing the river into Kentucky, enjoying this agricultural community. We have been so inspired by the support that we felt from the state of Kentucky. I will never forget walking into the Kentucky State House when we announced this farm back in January, seeing Governor Bashir standing there. I mean, you know, first of all, the fact that he wanted to talk to us at all was exciting. And then the questions that he started asking us about square footage, you know, about the details of our LED lighting and our irrigation systems. And I realized this is a guy who's really invested in the next generation of agriculture. And we found that to be the case throughout the state of Kentucky, that people here are interested in what's next. And in the potential in, in building and reinforcing the stable food systems. Which, by the way, is important for me to point out. Um, sometimes when I start talking about our technology, there are people who say, so you're going to replace conventional farms, right? I mean, this is, this is the end game. Some people are kind of excited about that possibility. Other people are horrified by it. Uh, and I will tell you, to the disappointment of the first crew, uh, we have no interest in only replacing anything that's on here. What we want to do is complement that. We have an opportunity to fill the gaps to replace you know, not the veggies that are growing on the local farms that you're working with, but the 99% of lettuce that's coming in from California and Arizona and losing, as you say, flavor, texture, and nutritional value in transit. We're using incredibly complex technology to do something incredibly simple, which is to get that fresh local produce to stores in 48 hours or less year-round. Now it's simple, but it's not easy. So, looking forward to talking more about that. I will say, unfortunately, I have to leave a little bit early today, 7.30. i got to go catch a flight, but it's important to be here with this group. So, if you can, um, write down my email address, jed.portman, first name, last name, at eafarms.com. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up. We love answering questions about what we do. Uh, thank you. Uh now, now that we've uh, started to come back to things in person, I realize that one of the things I didn't miss are those events where somebody introduces the introduction person before they introduce the speaker and uh, the thank yous get really long. So we're not going to do that, but I do want to say, first of all, thanks to the Campbell County Public Library for hosting us tonight. J.C. Morgan, raise your hand. the director of the library system, so thank you. And I uh, also want to thank uh, 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 Emma, Ethan, Beth, and Ben, the North Media crew. North Media has been with us uh, uh, since the pandemic started in order to, be, to, to uh, uh, do these events uh, with uh, good production values. Uh, uh, we, they've been with us for the Northern Kentucky Forum and also for a lecture series. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, and from the standpoint of my office, we're trying to do community engagement that involves students in something that's uh, their discipline so that they're learning as they're doing and uh, uh, I had an interesting conversation with KET when we first started this 
uh, to do Zoom production, they said, well, we don't know how to do it. We've never done it either. So we have a generation now of uh, graduates uh, 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 or soon to be graduates, seniors, uh, who uh, will leave NKU with some skills that weren't already in the marketplace. So North Media, thank you. I have uh, one prop that I uh, brought this evening. Uh, this is a cookbook from, I think, the 1950s in Estill County, which is where my family is from. Uh, and a friend gave it to me about a month ago. His mother had it. We don't know why. Uh, and I thought, well, this is interesting. I'll find my gr grandmother's recipes in here. And by the way, uh, there are a lot of good food on the planet, none better than her biscuit with her blackberry jam where we picked the blackberries the biscuit had to be out of the oven immediately buttered and jam on it uh, and it's fantastic but it's not in here uh, and uh, I'm looking through and uh, Mrs. Bill Bybee probably of the Bybee pottery family because that's the same county has a recipe for coke salad and I thought, okay, did I go to a family reunion where we had to eat that? Uh, it has a can of black cherries, a can of crushed pineapples, a box of strawberry jello, a box of raspberry jello, a one can of pecans, eight ounces of Philadelphia cream cheese, and two small Coca Colas. <laughs> um, in the back is a page called uh, Supper Quantity Cooking. Ham supper for 225. 48 pound canned ham. Just the one or 48? Uh, 48 pound. Now there's uh, coffee, biscuit, bisquick to make the biscuits. That's a, a real crime. So my question, panelists, and I'll let anybody start who wants to. How did we move? Uh, uh, Keith, I was looking at the history of your department. You go back to the 1800s, and of course, so that's just the moment when government really got involved in helping uh, farms and uh, uh, far and farmers. And somehow, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, we're opening cans to make recipes in rural communities. Uh, now we're starting to move back to something else. So, uh, what what happened to us, and how? Where are we in 2022? Are we moving past this finally? Uh, yeah. That's a big one. He's, I'm, going, he's I'm, jumping into it. I'll, I'll, I'll take the historical <laughs> angle if you want. Um, what we've seen over the last uh, 100 or so years, a little less than 100 years, particularly after the Second World War, yeah. is that industrialization came home to the United States. We had basically spun up a giant industrial apparatus for making war material uh, pretty much overnight. We needed something to do with it. We needed jobs for the boys coming back home. Uh, a lot of women had then entered the workforce um, and didn't want to undo um, some of that progress. And what you see in the 40s and 50s is a shift towards this kind of industrially mediated food system where uh, refrigeration was cheap and easy. Uh, where canning facilities were larger um, and could operate at a scale to supply uh, urban and rural grocery stores in a way that they hadn't before. Um, and so you see a turn. I've seen many a cookbook from about the same time. That, uh, they're all like this, you know? Um, and part of that was a fascination with a new uh, technology, no shade down the table there, uh, fascination with a new technology that really um, caused a lot of people to adopt this, but also the changing shape of work um, and the economy led to a lot of people relying on these convenience foods because all of a sudden, maybe your household has, uh, you know, you've got a couple of kids, but mom and dad are both working, right? You don't have someone there to manage the domestic economy in the way that you had in the sort of pre-industrial um, American household. So that at least is a like a historical perspective. I don't I don't think any of that's too controversial. There was but also a huge amount of marketing. Oh, so absolutely. Because, because there was all these excess industrial products, uh, they 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 embarked on a tremendous marketing journey to make the American public think that this was what you should be doing. And absolutely. so there there was a degree of I'm gonna say more or less brainwashing that happened that made people think that this was the modern, sexy, amazing way to eat. And Cleaner, it, and safer. And it made people forget 
a connection to food. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to add that marketing. It was Absolutely. intentionally, yeah. yeah. Well, that was also the beginning too of the shift from American agriculture as a smaller family operations organized around uh, very diverse cropping operations where you would have vegetable garden for yourself. You'd also be raising, at least in this uh, neighborhood, tobacco, um, cattle, sheep, goats, uh, you know, small scale vegetable crop production, grain production, feed production, all on one farm. And as the sort of industrial economy ramped up, you saw these small farms switching over to monocrop operations, grains, row crops, soy, uh, a little early for soy in the 50s, but uh, corn especially, corn, wheat, that sort of thing. So that was another shift in the um, food economy. I guess I'd also just add that we, we like to have what we want to have, right? So, oh, yeah. so when, when oranges used to be something uh, perhaps just that you'd have in your Christmas stocking because it was maybe available from across the country or, mm -hmm. or elsewhere, but, but a, still a seasonal fruit, um, we lost sight and, and were suddenly able to get them from other places in the world at other times um, too. And so now we're at a place where it's really just the specialty produce purchasers who understand which country a, 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 an item of produce is coming from and, and where it's when it's seasonal not just here but but elsewhere and what it really takes to get it from one place to another um, and we became able to to move food around um, mm -hmm. at the same time too yeah Tiffany you uh, run a farmers market in a community that may be the quintessential suburb in uh, uh, northern Kentucky uh, with uh, uh, you know young families in particular are uh, at least a generation or more removed from uh, the experience of being on a family farm. And yet you found some demand uh, to get, uh, in fact, uh, the school district in Fort Thomas a few years ago had a uh, no cans policy and hired a chef. Uh, so something's happening uh, in the marketplace that people want this. Yeah, so I think that um, there is, so coming from the generation where, frankly, my family didn't eat a lot of farm fresh food at all, um, those recipes that you're talking about are like that is very much what I grew up eating. Um, and so I would, this has been quite a learning journey for me. And so, um, but I think that that's what the, the Fort Thomas community, as well as um, kind of the country as a whole, is people are realizing that um, the more science is revealing how much what you eat affects your body. I think that that's kind of where it starts. It's how does this affect me? Um, and so I think that our, the Fort Thomas community and others, um, especially parents are very conscious of what they're feeding their children. And I think that that's probably for many of us, like one of the first times when we really start to think about what is in our food. Um, and as we serve, like so we have so many families in our, in our community that attend our market. Um, and, and so I think that parents really have gotten this idea said in the very beginning of those baby books is what you feed your children matters. And every parent cares about how their child is developing. And so as people learn, they, um, they start to explore more about what's available. And so I think that um, we have really seen that happen. So we have a wide range of traditional farmers all the way to um, certified organic farmers. Um, and so, and each one has different techniques, but they're all sourcing their food locally, like from farms that are right here in our community. Um, we have meat farmers who are doing the same thing. And so everything that is coming to the farmer's market um, is the best quality that you're going to find in the area. And so I think that that's really what people are gravitating toward is this idea of, um, these foods are better for my family. Um, and then out after that, I think that they are beginning to watch what's happening in um, their communities as far as um, just nutritional deserts that we're seeing. Um, not so much necessarily in Fort Thomas, but in the communities that you read about and, and just right outside our doorstep. Um, and then you also are watching what's happening with the climate change. And as people are becoming more and more aware, they're seeking out for ways that they can make a difference. And so I think that an easy way to do that is to start visiting your farmer's market. Um, one, it makes great photo ops. Like there is, I feel very lucky on a weekly basis. Like there is nowhere easier to take more beautiful pictures than at the farmer's market. Um, and so if nothing else, that's a drop. But I think it's definitely this idea of wanting to serve your family the best. And then also this uh, wanting to um, better your community and the place that you live. And so we're definitely, as we have conversations with our customers, we're just seeing more and more of that desire to participate in that and to learn more about that. Can I, Keith, can I come to you for a minute at kind of at the policy level? 
Uh, of course, we were a tobacco economy for uh, a number a number of years, and it, uh, 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 if you don't think about the health consequences for a minute, it was uh, 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 strong economically and strong economically for small farmers, uh, many of whom said this, you know, had their, uh, their uh, acres for tobacco and it was uh, maybe the Christmas money. Uh, that all changed radically pretty uh, quickly. Uh, and uh, if we we're going to continue to have um, of, uh, prosperous farmers and family farms and nutritional uh, food, something has to change at the uh, policy uh, uh, level. Uh, and I'm sure, sure that falls to your department. What's that look like? Uh, what, do, what do you hear from farmers in 2022 about uh, how it's working out? Well, I think the one thing that all of us could agree on is change is inevitable. I mean, that is what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about change from 1850 when Abraham Lincoln created USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and it hit during his 1850s, 1860s, all the way through to the change of what World War I and World War II brought to us, all the way to today. But ultimately, for agriculture, it's what does the consumer want? What is the consumer willing to pay for? Will it's the consumer? Let me give you a couple examples to try to, to or one example to, to talk about how that policy developed. My mother was an ex, uh, extension agent for the Kentucky Extension Service, Cooperative Extension Service, home economist agent in Hardin County. When I was growing up in the 1960s, she came home at night from the grocery store with a head of lettuce, bag of carrots, celery, maybe some other things, and she made a toss salad. What do our grocery shoppers, I'm not going to say moms, because <laughs> dads do grocery shopping too, but what do our grocery shoppers often do today when they walk into Kroger's or Costco or wherever? They pick up a bag, it's already washed, it's already there, it's convenience. The message I want to deliver with that is, is there's room for everybody in this marketplace. There's room for everybody at this table, there's room for everybody who's a commercial scale farmer because some of those that can't afford or don't have the disposable income to make it the purchase at the farmer's market or to go to uh, one of the upper scale type restaurants. They may be shopping for their food and their kids at Walmart. I know I have a little piece in my Chamber of Commerce speech, as I call it, that I used to use. That person may even be shopping at the local gas station because they don't have the money to get to Walmart. Okay. We have a segment of agriculture, or excuse me, segment of the population that's that way. So policy, Mark, to get to your question, basically has to encompass everybody. We're very proud, and we've been supporting local food movement, Kentucky Proud, uh, now at the Department of Agriculture. I've not been there that long, but for over 20 years. I, w I ran the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund during the Ernie Fletcher administration as executive director of GOAP. That is the entity that funds Kentucky Proud. That is the entity that has built many of the 170 farmers markets that we have across the state of Kentucky to develop and grow this local foods economy. But you know, today that fund is now at, K at the Department of Agriculture instead of the governor's office, and we continue that. Just this week, uh, Tuesday I think it was, we sat down with two gentlemen who are trying to develop a local food entity in West Lowell. You know, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for how can we develop the market? Because if you develop the market, the farmer will grow to it and he'll produce for it if they can make money and if they can make a living out of that. Absolutely. And so basically, there's the message is there's room for everybody. And the policies that we have, the policies that USDA uses in the Farm Bill, oftentimes, you know, lots of folks like to point to them and say that's for big corporate ag. Bottom line is, they are designed, crop insurance, whatever it may, risk management tools, whatever else, they fit every farmer. And so policy is there to grow that marketplace and let the farmer find their place in it. Can I go to 80 acres? You're uh, changing the model of what industrial farming, if that's a term we can use, but large scale farming uh, uh, looks you're like. That term, but yes, yeah, well, uh, here we're, I mean, we are building plant factories to some extent. So I was thinking about your comment about technology. Um, Agriculture has always been about innovation. It's always been driven by technology, but we've gone in the wrong direction in the last century or so. Uh, we built these incredibly impressive supply chains, right, that allow you to get basically whatever you want, whenever you want, to a location that's convenient to you. But these supply chains, they're over-optimized for cost. They're over-optimized for convenience. 
Fact is, though, in the near future, they're not going away. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in getting fresh local produce into Kroger, which is something we can do. You know, I, I'm a farmer's market shopper, to say the least. Um, my wife is in the audience here. She can tell you we devote a significant percentage of our budget to, <laughs> to farmer's markets. Um, you know, even in our relatively bougie suburban Cincinnati circles, most of the folks we know go to Kroger. Uh, that's our core consumer. And you should hear the feedback that people get when they're trying this fresh local lettuce, fresh local tomatoes. Wow, I didn't know lettuce could taste like this. And it's simple. We're not flavor dusting the lettuce. It's just fresh. You know, it's just lettuce that didn't travel, again, 2,000 miles in a truck across the country. And, you know, so in my view, we're all on the same team here. I mean, this is, this is messaging about the value of fresh, nutritious, local food. And, you know, about getting away from the tomatoes grown in Mexico and the pineapples grown, who knows where, in the produce that doesn't have the flavor or the nutritional value. I mean, again, remarkable, you can, you can buy that today, but by the time it gets to the store, by the time it gets into your cart, it's, it's fundamentally dead, right? Uh, if it ever had life to begin with. So we have a great opportunity, I think, to uh, get people excited about the benefits of growing and supporting local. Thank you. I think uh, everybody on the panel, uh, I appreciate reflections from everybody on this next question, but Ben, I'd like to start with uh, you. Is It's not just uh, uh, the production and the taste of the product, but it's also the dignity of the farmer uh, and uh, uh, independence. Uh, uh, what, uh, you know, I've, I've heard it uh, talked about in, in uh, raising corn and, and beans at, uh, with the big machines that you get loans from and next thing you know you've got lights and a stereo and you're working till midnight uh, doing all that uh, and then getting up at six to start again and your life is not your own it doesn't really feel like farming uh, but uh, um, we will also want to get back to something that gives an economic dignity uh, and uh, and uh, it takes a market to support that kind of a community uh, mm -hmm. can you talk about that a bit sure um Fundamentally, what we see in, in this part of the country in particular, um, we have it better than most other places in this country, frankly, um, in terms of support from the state, and especially in a lot of the marketing programs. Um, we raise basically the best livestock in the country. We have a lot of uh, really avail like well available uh, nutrition in our pastures. Um, and we have a culture that remembers how to farm. The reason things look the way they do across the farm economy, across the whole country, everything looks that way for a reason. There are very good economic reasons why the most successful farmers in this country, and I say that in terms of uh, like net proceeds, are farming 20,000 acres in Kansas, right? It's a balance of uh, some things like policy related things, but also like availability of land, availability of credit, and you catch a good wave on the commodities market, essentially. And if you catch that good wave on the commodities market, well, you're set up for a couple of years. If you catch a couple of bad years on it, you're out of business, right? So the, basically, the two kinds of farming that are left in this country are very small entrepreneurial farms. Um, these are the folks that you see at the farmer's market um, who, in many ways, are doing the work of about three or four people. Um, to bring their product to market. You've got to raise the product, you've got to process the product, you've got to market and distribute the product yourself, and you have to run your own books, usually. Um, these should be different jobs, or at least one person shouldn't be obligated to do all of these for the same farm. The other kind of farming that's left is this larger scale industrial farming. And again, there are good reasons, well, not good reasons, but <laughs> legible, understandable reasons um, why we've ended up in this position. What we have basically hollowed out is that middle section of the economy. Uh, what we would call a mid-sized farm here is 150 to 250 acres, uh, diverse, usually livestock based these days because that's what makes money around here um, on that scale. Uh, and those farms are, if not, if not gone, then going, certainly. And so to be able to come in and put something in underneath those, that's a lot of what we're doing with our home place meat. That's a lot of what we can take advantage of with um, a lot of the really good distribution options around here, like what chefs want. And when Local Food Connection was 
uh, on its own um, before you all merged, uh, you know, you all were one of the first partners that we had in building this program up. And so to be able to support a type of farming that does not require you to be running the combine at three in the morning, uh, to be able to support a type of farming that doesn't require you to drive heavy equipment out over wet fields because you work your steel mill job all week and you're farming on the weekends basically to try and keep the payment coming in, you know, um, that's the goal. And I th I'd say everyone who's working in that space, like, obviously, if you don't have farmers making money, they're not going to be able to farm, period, full stop. There's why no don't way you, around oh, it. Go ahead. Well, I think another, <clears throat> another thing that's sort of tied into this is with the concept of the dignity of, of farmers, um, and I think this also connects with our conversation about this fallout of an industrialized food is the devaluation of what food is worth. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you know, I know that we're experiencing 8.5% uh, inflation, but in my industry, it's, it's really fascinating because um, you know we sell real food, we purchase real food, we make everything. And the challenge is that industrial, not, a, not only industrial farming, but also industrial restauranting, Mm -hmm. McDonald's, fast food has made people have a completely distorted valuation of food. You, they, there's this idea that you can go and you can eat for three ninety nine. Mm -hmm. That's not food. And so the unfortunate reality is that the nutrition, the nutrient dense food that we're talking about over here, it's not free. It's not cheap. Someone has to raise seedlings. They have to incubate them. Maybe they have loss. Maybe they have flooding. You know, mm -hmm. there's all these elements. Food costs money. Yeah, they have to sell it for money in order to raise their family. So, we have like a distorted understanding of the value of food, and yeah. so as a culture, we're kind of warring against not only industrialized agriculture but also fast food, which I I, I personally do consider kind of an enemy. <laughs> <laughs> not only not not for me really really as a restaurant tour, but for me as as a member of our society, because I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's real. Mm -hmm. Anna, you, uh, uh, I know you said you, you get excited about systems, but you're also excited about food, and it's a system that uh, I, I think it's fair to say is bringing the opportunity for the dignity for the farmer and for an, an economy that supports something that's um, uh, more like the old family farm. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things I wanted to bring up as, as you were talking and what I was thinking about is that both of us are aggregators, right? So you mm -hmm. work, uh, uh, Barry Center and our home place meets, mm -hmm. not only works with one farm, they exactly. work with how many farms did you say? Uh, 11 right now headed towards 15 okay. at the moment, yeah. all in Henry County. Yeah. And, and then on our side, so another example of doing uh, something similar, and so, so they produce a, a product that's under a um, one label and mm -hmm. under one and has the efficiencies of, of working together and, and includes the farms in, in coming up with, mm -hmm. with um, decisions mm -hmm. uh, along the way. So on our side, an example of, of where we do that and where that's been very powerful in, in bringing small-scale agriculture and, and mid-sized agriculture larger is that, that for larger buyers, they don't want to go and, and have to find five pounds here and five pounds there and five pounds there. And often farms will say to me, well, we're not big enough to work with you. And mm -hmm. I say, yes, you are. Because if Cincinnati Public Schools or if, um, which I should mention, by the way, Cincinnati Public Schools and many of the Northern Kentucky and uh, across Kentucky schools have wonderful farm to school programs. And, and it is really leading um, Many other buyers do too, but just this attempt to really connect kids with uh, with um, good nutritious food from farms is is impactful for the students, but it's also really making a difference for farms these days. So I have to I have to applaud our schools um, and many others in stepping forward. But if I look at at for instance Cincinnati Public Schools or Boone County Schools or or others who are buying and, and want to buy um, produce from local farms. It would be very easy to go to a large uh, local farm and say, okay, I need, um, for the school system, I need 250 pounds of zucchini that they're all going to get tomorrow. Um, so we can do that and we can just do it in the traditional way. Or what we can do and what we try to do that, that or try to do that uh, David was referring to is that we try to plan in advance with the farms. So, okay, so you can have uh, 25 pounds a week of zucchini and feel good about that. And what would you like to charge for that? No, oh, that might be a little high, but we'll try. 
oh, you can have 120 pounds of zucchini a week. And what would you like to charge for that? Okay, that, that sounds pretty good. And I can get the two together pretty well so that I'm paying you what you need here. Uh, maybe marketing it to, to others as well, um, getting you what you need here, and it all works together. It's still traceable, we're still reporting from which farms it's from, but we're supporting the small and the large at the same time. So the power of aggregation is bringing together the small farms in an organized way, um, whether it's under one label, whether it's individual farm um, tracing to the, to the client. That's how we start moving, moving the system forward. And if I could really quick, mm -hmm. what you are describing is almost exactly the mechanism, uh, production control and market management that undergirded the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative, which kept money on small and medium-sized farms to a degree sort of unmatched in American agricultural history. The idea of being able to promise farm this is what we do, we write contracts with our farmers at the top of the year. They get paid at the top of the year. Um, and then, you know, uh, there are adjustments made based on processing size and things like that. But essentially, they know they have a legal guarantee that their work, their work will not be wasted because prices weren't as high as they usually are at the cattle sale. You know what I mean? It's, it's promised to them. They know how much it's going to be. They know how to budget, et cetera, et cetera. Hugely important. Um, for someone who, like you're saying, is harvesting 25, 30 pounds of zucchini a week, along with 200 other crops or whatever. But just being able to guarantee that, that um, kind of uh, distribution of market need is so important, so, so important. And what we see happen is that farms graduate up. So, mm -hmm. so Lobenstein Farm is one that we've worked with now for, for four years. They're actually in, in Indiana across, across the border. But, but it's just a really nice example where they, they started just doing a few things for us and then it took on more. And, and now they sell to much larger buyers. They brought in um, a 37 uh, boxes of, of sweet corn today just for one buyer. Each, each box is four dozen <laughs> sweet corn. So just, and you know, they just keep adding more on each year. And as they grow into those buyers, then we welcome in a smaller farm who can do some of the more specialty, interesting things that farm to table restaurants are looking for. Um, it just gets bigger and bigger. Keith, I'm gonna come to you in just a minute, but I want to, uh, Tiffany, if you would just tell us, uh, what's the demand look like at the uh, Fort Thomas? Uh, uh, you're you're open for a long time. You talked to anecdotally about people anxiously waiting for March for it to start. Yes. But uh, uh, is have you seen the demand grow or what's? Uh, so it was very interesting. Um, full disclosure: I came into this job last year. Um, so this is, however. Um, this is my second season with the Fort Thomas Farmers Market. Um, so I wasn't here for 2020, but one of the things that um, farmers markets across the country saw happen in 2020 was this idea that um, suddenly farmers markets were essential. And so there was this renewed interest in farmers markets um, for all of the beautiful things that farmers markets have to offer. So during 2020, as we all know, um, stores were shut down. You couldn't see your friends. You couldn't go out into the, the community. Um, but farmers markets were this really unique opportunity opportunity to um, go and get your groceries um, and to kind of stop in and see you know, get, get some fresh air, um, check in with your neighbors to see kind of how they were doing in a safe way. And so it created um, this, in addition to just the, the food that it offered, it also um, showed people what farmers markets have to offer as far as this very relational place that we have. Uh, the cool, I think that there are many cool things at a farmers market, but Maybe the most important one is the way that you interact with your farmers um, because then you can have those conversations and when you have those conversations and you meet those farmers face to face like Lobenstein, um, I ate some of their tomatoes yesterday actually. Um, I think we have a case of cherry tomatoes in my front room. They're so good. Um, yeah. Oh, they're yellow watermelon, yes. Um, but you have the opportunity to build those relationships and then suddenly this one trip to the farmer's market um, becomes something that is important in, on many levels. Um, and so I think that um, we are definitely seeing, we saw a huge jump in interest in farmer's markets in 2020 and 21. Um, I will say that kind of our current economy state has, um, I would say just leveled things off. We haven't seen the growth um, that we have seen in the preceding years. And that's kind of a, a theme for many farmers markets around the country right now. Um, so I would say that people are still very interested in 
purchasing, um, I would say the interest has grown the amount of disposable income because farmers markets are more expensive for many reasons. Um, that has kind of, that's leveled off a little bit, but it's holding very stable. Keith, if you'll hold with me just one minute, we're going to, I think, lose Jed in about four minutes. So uh, if you want to weigh in on this or just your parting words of wisdom before you fly off. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, it is it is so inspiring um, to hear from all these people. We, we've always been a collaborative company. We've always done uh, a lot of work with local. Um, as a matter of fact, Local Food Connection, by the way, I have to say, helped us get off the ground early on. Absolutely. It continues to be an important part of our story. So I hope this spurs more conversation among us uh, about what we can do. You know, again, I, I, I think vertical farming is part of the solution. I think it has to be part of the solution. I mean, look, I was just in eastern Kentucky yesterday uh, volunteering in, uh, in the town of Heinemann that's it's been pretty affected, pretty severely affected by flooding. We're seeing more and more of this every year. It's disrupting traditional agriculture. It's requiring us to come up with innovative solutions. But this is just one of those innovative solutions. And what I see and what I get excited about is the opportunity to build a nationwide and worldwide network of local farms linked together by these indoor farms that are growing that foundational produce, your lettuce, your tomatoes, the things consumers are gonna to continue to demand, whether it makes any sense or not in a more sustainable way all year round. So excited about the potential there, and uh, I do have to dip out, but thank you so much. For, thank you. For giving me that opportunity, and, and yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Uh, you and by the way, uh, you know, we can say thank you, Jen. <laughs> Travel safe. Uh, one um, uh, mentioned uh, Eastern Kentucky, and I, I know at least two of our uh, uh, participants on the panel tonight have uh, right on the front of their web pages uh, ways to help uh, Eastern Kentucky, the Berry Center, and the state uh, both do. So uh, keep that in mind. There are people uh, um, facing immense hardship there. Uh, Keith, if uh, we could go back to, uh, well, two things uh, really about market and demand and how to meet what help uh, farmers. Uh, maybe you could give us kind of a statewide picture of what's happening with farmers markets because you all support those a lot. And secondly, uh, what do you hear from farmers uh, that they need in order to uh, sort of, uh, I think really uh, maybe just to rebuild what uh, Ben described, a, 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 a small farm economy that's focused around uh, vegetables rather than tobacco? Well, uh, great question. and, and the Kind of pick up where Tiffany left off too. I mean, there is no question across the country, the trend is to kind of leveling off, kind of flattening off and what we're seeing in farmer's market. So let me kind of take that one on first and then talk about the expansion side because one of the things that we're seeing is labor. There's no question. Labor is affecting the product, production agriculture. Uh, just not on farmer's market side, it's affecting production agriculture, large scale operations, mid scale, everything else uh, with the type uh, market that we have. But with that said, one of the things that I think continues to bring the farm to table market forward, farmer's markets forward, is the recognition of entities, agencies such as Department of Agriculture, USDA, other state departments of agriculture, is the need to build that chain in the middle. Give you, as we've talked about up here. To give you an example, when COVID hit, what was one of the things that was empty in the grocery store? The meat shelf, the meat shelf. One, in the last two and a half years through the Ag Development Board, we have put $6 million into meat processing, protein processing in the state of Kentucky to increase the capacity of those small slaughter facilities that we have 32 roughly, I think it is, that. Uh, that do uh, farm animals. So to do that, basically, uh, a lot of those businesses, small mom and pop businesses, maybe one or two owners, but basically the thing they're up against again is labor. And so that's the next challenge that we're beginning to work on is what do we do about the labor side? And, we're, and I'm just not talking labor, I'm talking skilled labor. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can go into and become a meat cutter. Not everybody knows what to do inside any part of a slaughter facility. And so uh, not only is KDA doing that, but also USDA is also doing some of that work on the same level from the standpoint 
of, of looking at how do we beef up the training programs that we have across the country. No pun intended. No. Okay. <laughs> pork up. Okay, pork up. <laughs> uh, but how, how, do we, uh, how, how do we increase those uh, opportunities? But long story, long story is, is that, you know, bottom line is the people. You know, those are jobs that oftentimes people don't want to do. Why do we have migrant labor in produce production across, just not out west, but across the country? Is because our people don't want to do it. It kind of goes back to the, what we talked about in the first few minutes. You know, we found it convenient to go through McDonald's. We found it convenient to buy that bag of lettuce. And lifestyles changed, and it's the consumer's right to pick what lifestyle that is. But as we see more and more people want that fresh produce, as we see more and more schools step up and want, it's our job at KDA and other entities like Cross the Front to, to put that out there. The, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've done in Kentucky. Uh, I've been involved directly with it now since about 2003 in some form or fashion, 20 years. But when you go back and look at what we've done in Kentucky, and this is to address the tobacco uh, scenario, in 1997, tobacco was a $1 billion crop in Kentucky in just short of a $3 billion agriculture. Tobacco was one-third of our gross receipts. Today, we are north of 600, six, excuse me, six million, six billion, excuse me, six billion dollars, probably gonna approach seven billion this year. But we're north of that, and tobacco is 250 to 300 million dollars now. So you can see the impact that that's had on Kentucky agriculture. Now, how does that all play out? The Ag Development Fund, which is half 50 percent of the master settlement agreement, the tobacco money that comes back to Kentucky, we've invested over 600 million dollars of that money since 2001 into diversifying Kentucky agriculture, which has helped lead this mark, lead this effort. Also, in, at the same time. We have built the Kentucky Agriculture Finance Corporation, which is now a lending arm of that entity to do small, low interest loans for beginning farmers, infrastructure, marketing, loans at 2.75%. Even with interest rates going up, it's becoming more of a bargain again. But, but what I'm saying that is we now have 100 million of that 600 million invested back into that size of a small bank. And we're helping lots of small, lots of young farmers, and not, I shouldn't say young farmers, I should say beginning farmers, because a lot of our beginning farmers are 50 and 60 years old. Yep. You know, they're, they're coming out of a career and they're wanting to go back, hey, I want to grow this and sell it to farmer's market. So opportunity, consumer demand is, is really what it comes down to from the policy standpoint. And, you know, for those that still raise tobacco, we have just short of 2,000 farmers in Kentucky that still do raise tobacco. It's all under contract. That's their choice. They can do that, and we and we support them to the extent that we can. But the real place for us, and the real place for most government policy and agencies, is is to pr promote and support and push where the consumer wants to go, which is what we're doing at Local Foods. I want to remind everybody: uh, if you have a question on your card, just hold that up, and uh, one of my able assistants will uh, 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 get it and will uh, get your questions asked. I saw some people writing questions, so. Uh, 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 but uh, while I'm waiting for those to come up, uh, uh, Keith, I don't think you'll hate me for this, but uh, I, I know you, you're in public service, so you're used to questions uh, from the public. But I'm going to just start, uh, Tiffany, if you'll go first uh, and work our way down. Uh, what is it uh, that the state could do for you as, uh, from the perspective of uh, where you're at in this place? What would you like to see in state policy? So I think that the most important thing is something that Keith um, mentioned earlier, and that's that, um, that divide between what the consumer may want, um, but when what the consumer can afford. I think that that's something that we um, at Farmers Markets are constantly trying to troubleshoot where that is. Um, I don't think it's a matter of necessarily people don't want farm fresh produce. I think that really everyone wants that to be accessible to them. Um, but the truth is that because on a, we're talking about a smaller scale that's not subsidized on some of the level of the industrial farms, um, the things cost more money. Um, and so even, even if it's better, that doesn't mean that you can practically afford that. And so um, one of the things that I am 
working to figure out more solutions for is just how to make that more accessible to a wider range of customers um, and just make it more inclusive. Um, and I know that there are several programs um, that Kentucky does have and there's there are a lot of things I think that um, just once again, continuing that education of consumers, like this is a, these, the, the Kentucky double dollars that's out there, the senior program. Um, our market does ex accept SNAP, and I think there are a, a lot of markets that do, but people don't realize that. And so just continuing to work on that as a solution. And I think that the more that, um, the more that farmers are not pushed to the wall with their costs, I mean, like you ask any farmer, as I'm sure you all know, like fertilizer costs, like you're talking about labor, but also fertilizer and supply costs, I mean, they're so high. And so our farmers are working hard to keep their their costs affordable to consumers, but also keep their lights on and, and for it to be a career that's worth having. Um, and so I think that just from... I really appreciate a lot of the things that the KDA has done. I, I have gotten to learn a lot about that over the last couple of years. Um, and so I think that really you guys are doing a good job. Um, but I think that from my perspective as a market manager, just continuing to find ways to push that information um, to make more resources accessible to customers who are wanting to make the, the choice for local good produce um, but maybe can't stretch their budget that far. I think that for me that's something that uh, would be a huge and because the addition to that then is that those are dollars that then are spent with farmers in the local in, in Kentucky, right? So it's not just a benefit to the consumer, it's a benefit to the farmers. I mean there's I I don't know specific numbers, I'm sure that you do, <laughs> but as far as how many how many SNAP dollars are out there that generally go to the large grocery stores and things. Um, I love that 80 Acres is, is supplying their, their local produce to grocery stores. I think that that's great um, because it then makes it more accessible. So I would say that from my perspective, accessibility is one of the most important things because it benefits really everyone along that chain. Keith, if you want to respond to that. or that Well, real quickly, and Tiffany mentioned Double Dollar, Senior Farmers Market, uh, SNAP, those are programs that we we either the minister or play a role in in some form or fashion with the farmers markets technology we've got farmers markets that don't have wi-fi don't have cell phone signal so they they can't utilize those programs because many of those programs are technology based where you got to have a card or swipe so you know working to bring that you know i think i'm trying to remember it's 42 out of the 70 i believe now i have the senior farmers market program so those are the things that we're working to expand. We just brought on a new vendor, and <clears throat> there were some issues with this new vendor. Some of you may be aware of that with Senior <laughs> Farmers Market, and then a laugh. But uh, anyway, uh, this new vendor, because the old one could not do it. USDA put them out to pasture. We had to go back and, 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 and come up with a new vendor to, to run this program with. But expanding, once we get them through the first year, I think we can, we can grow on that. Uh, Ag Development Board has invested, uh, fact, actually did the match money for the double dollars when we started that four, five, maybe six years ago now. So these are the things that are there. Uh, part of our effort is going to be to grow them. You know, when it comes to the supply side, to fertilize, the, uh, the inputs, the labor cost and everything else, there's not much anybody can do about that. I mean, you know, part of what we're facing in the fertilize is uh, simply because of the COVID, because of labor shortages in those manufacturers, but then also the Ukraine war. So uh, there's a lot of factors that play into that that farmers are having to adjust around. I know a lot of farmers who normally would have fertilized their, their cattle pastures this spring who didn't do it because it, they couldn't afford it. It yep. did not make sense to put that fertilize uh, on that pasture. Now they can get by a year or two in many cases, but you can't go much more than a couple, three years. So, you know, these are these are the economic financial things that, that the producers uh, have, to, have to adjust to. David? Uh, well, I was actually just talking to my friend, <laughs> Anna, about this. this. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's this, I mean, we're talking about farm to table uh, I was talking a little bit about sort of like the connection with food a huge part about being able to eat local produce in Kentucky um, is understanding how to preserve it um, food preservation is uh, very much um, something that was passed down uh, from generations it's something that you have to know how to do because uh, you know I came here from California we had strawberries for nine months really good strawberries talking about strawberries here it's three weeks uh, and when the seasons come, um, they're much more concentrated in Kentucky than anywhere else I've ever cooked. And so what happens is the food comes, it comes fast, it comes hard, and then it drops to below zero in the winter. You got nothing. Mm -hmm. So in order to deal with that, in order to cope with that, uh, 
canning is the predominant preservation technique. So, um, and this is something I think is just good to talk about at this forum in general, is that in order to engage in farm-to-table eating in your home, preservation is really important. It's a, it's a skill, uh, it's a trade, and, uh, and I'm not up here to get on a soapbox or anything like that, but we actually have had a really, really hard time with the health department um, with helping us utilize those techniques in feeding people in our restaurants. And so, I'm not, that's one of the hardest parts, you asked, asked about the state, one of the hardest parts is that we're trying to do it right, and so we can, we can you know, we pickle peppers, we, we do all these things so that we can have gorgeous food in the wintertime to sustain people. And we just gotten, it's not easy, you have to get, uh, you have to submit HACCP plans, they're extremely long, they're incredibly complicated, and this is sort of like an artisanal craft that people have been doing for a really, really long time. So the hardest part for us is that the, the state has been pushing back and saying you can't do that. And we're saying, well, this is integral to cooking this way. We can't cook this way. So I've just been freezing everything this year, but it's, it's actually really hard. Keith, you heard this one before? Uh, I have heard this one before. And uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges that we have in innovation and new products in this country is three word, three letters, FDA. And uh, we, you know, I don't, we, we haven't even discussed hemp and not need, don't need to today, but hemp is just the perfect example that I can point to for Kentucky where the FDA literally has destroyed an industry, literally destroyed an industry. You know, food safety, uh, just as all of these panel members and I are, are passionate about local food and Kentucky Proud and those sorts of things, those food safety inspectors are passionate about, I got to do everything I can, I got to cross every tick, I got to dot every eye to make sure that nothing can go wrong here. What happens is, is we don't come to the middle. Most of us don't come to the middle. We don't find the common sense level of risk we're willing to accept. The food safety people want it absolutely no, never have an accident at all. You know, and that's where FDA is, for example, on hemp. They're not willing to move on hemp because they don't, they don't. Just to be think clear, you're saying hemp, H-E-M-P? Yes. H-E-M-P, right. yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, they're not willing to move at all. So what we basically need in, in government is common sense. We need the consumer to realize, okay, I'm willing to, sell, I'm willing to accept this level of risk to buy that product, okay, but the government needs to be able to say, okay, consumer, you're smart enough, we're gonna let you assume that risk if you want to. We'll put the warning label on it so that you can understand what you're buying, but we'll let you go ahead and do it. You know, one of the, I'll throw this in on top of this, one of the most interesting things to me that we have dealt with in, in agriculture legislation, especially in Kentucky and the General Assembly in the last couple of years has been around food safety. Raw milk, um, allowing people to do bakeries, uh, baked goods in a home that's not got a commercial kitchen. And raw milk won't move, baked goods does. And um, the, uh, the, the third one, I just lost the third one. But so it's interesting to see how legislators, policymakers deal with those things because they don't always come down on the same side. It's really truly, where is the, where's the consumer? Where is the, is the push to do it? You know, uh, and oh, I know what the other one is, poultry. Uh, yeah. Poultry processing. Huge uh, issue. It's a huge issue in Kentucky. We do not have, I mean, I talked about this six million a while ago. We do not have the capacity in Kentucky to process small farm poultry like we need to, like the demand is for it. Why? Because that's a federal inspected program. And the federal inspection is way beyond the capacity of anybody except a Tyson or a Purdue, yeah. just to be honest with you. I mean, you can't build a small slaughter facility to process poultry and meet those expectations. But if we have one Simon, Simonella outbreak, one situation where we have food poisoning, somebody dies, those government officials are scared to death that they're going to get the blame. So they go to that 10th degree and not allow it to happen. Anna, your turn. So I have three. Fire away. <laughs> and, and one is to continue David's question, because you brought this up to me months and months ago, and I, I've been stewing on it, right? Because I stew on, on issues to, <laughs> to try to solve them. So um, one thing that I do want to say is I, I have the privilege of going into other states. So I, I work with farms in Ohio. I'm starting a little in Tennessee, believe it or not. We work a little bit in, in Indiana, a little in Illinois, and other places. And I uh, constantly am bringing to other states, could you just talk to Kentucky? Because they figured 
figured this out a long time ago. Sorry, everybody else. But but uh, Kentucky is, is just way ahead. And, and one of the pieces that is now being replicated uh, or used on a federal level is, a, is the food safety cost share for farmers in particular. So farmers that work with us have to have, have food safety audits. So they need to come up with their food safety paperwork. They need to be able to show that they are following certain practices like hand washing and, and that they're training their staff properly. And that's just a that's just something that happens. With food artisans, um, and I would, I'm gonna call you a food artisan here, so we call food artisans uh, makers of cheese, makers of canned goods, makers of other items that might not be um, exactly a, a produced on a, on a farm product. Um, I have missed uh, that opportunity to share with them uh, resources and cost shares. So there is uh, Kentucky State University, I know has fabulous trainings on HACCP plans that you need. Uh, UK has the Food Connection th that mostly trains farmers on GAP, but not that I know of, is there any kind of cost share that would help you get there? And so you know, you've talked about selling your jam, you've talked about selling other things too. And so as a food artisan, it would be great to have, have the ability to take Kentucky goods, turn it into a Kentucky-made product, but have some help getting getting it, because we also require that for, for those types of products, too. So that's that's one small request, <laughs> a small one. The other two are, are um, you have a really great, uh, you have many great sets of teams. So I work often with Kentucky Proud. I, I've been working with your Office of Food Distribution, and Farm to School is there, too. And they're just, they're fantastic. Um, so I've already... I've already uh, given these thoughts, but I, I want to share them as well. And, and they're very open to these, but these are very large problems. So um, across the nation, each state is being uh, asked to come up with ways to um, help uh, farms who have not had, farms and farmers who have not had opportunity in the past have, have more opportunity, so to spread equity into farming. Um, so. Um, whether that is um, farmers of a BIPOC background, it's often said, farmers of um, economic disadvantage, um, just of other, other reasons that they have not been able to, to farm or to have land in the past. I don't know the answer there. I don't think your, your team knows the answer there. I don't think anybody in the state knows the answer there, but we're working on it. So I'd, I'd like to applaud you for starting on that as I, as I talk with your team members, but, but say that's, that's one place that I see uh, the movement across the, the country going is to have lots of different types of farms of different scales um, and different backgrounds. And then the second one you've already brought up today and others have too, is that one of the, the most difficult things we grapple with and are asked to help with. So as, as Creation Gardens or What Chefs Want, the, our local team is within a distribution company that goes throughout the entire state of Kentucky. And yet it is very difficult for us to have enough food on routes going to some of the rural parts. And so what, what I get calls from Eastern Kentucky or Western Kentucky saying, our students don't have fresh produce. Um, our, uh, you know, not only do they want local produce, but they don't even have fresh produce. So that distribution is, uh, continues to be so difficult and lots of people are working on it. But I, I just, it's, it's so hard to see farms there and not to know what the answer is. Um, farms there want to provide to their communities. Communities want to buy from their farms. Lots of people working on it, but it's it's not happening yet. So, Keith, any quick reflections yeah. on those? <laughs> well, uh, great, uh, three great points. And I think one of the, the, on the last one, one of the things that you, you grow this stuff small. Yeah. Change comes over, as I said earlier, it's a challenge, it's just, change comes over time. I mean. It's hard for me to believe that I've been in this game now for 20 years, and and but when I stop and look, how far we've come, you know, uh, and and I mean, there probably wasn't 30 farmers markets 20 years ago in the state of Kentucky. I'm guessing I don't know what that number is, but there, there could have been many more than that. But so I mean, we've come a long way, and we've come a long way oftentimes in challenges. Schools, for a long time, schools couldn't buy local. USDA regulations didn't allow them to do it. Okay, we've, we've overcome some of that, not all of it, but we've overcome some of that. You know, Congress, I talked about FDA a while ago, Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act, I think it was in 2011, if I remember right, more than 10 years ago, and it's just now being implemented by the FDA, okay? That is putting another regulatory burden on our farmers, but it goes back to that safety that I talked about a while ago, balancing that safety out. And to tell you what we did in Kentucky, 
Kentucky Department of Agriculture agreed to run that program for the FDA because we didn't want FDA DC on the farms in Kentucky. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that we do to try to, to, try to address this. Going back to the cost share on the processing side, we've done a little of that Good. from the standpoint of in that original project initial, but maybe that's something we need to look at from the standpoint of long term, somebody already up and operating. Yeah. Ben? Um, I will be very quick, uh, but it's very interesting to me that we've all, we're all sort of dancing around the same issue in a lot of ways, which is, warms my heart as a sort of partisan for this, infrastructure, 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 infrastructure. We have some of the best farmers on the planet uh, right here who do not have a way to reasonably get product to market. Um, poultry processing, huge, and I say that as someone who raises and kills about 50 chickens a year for his own use. Um, boy, I'd really like to offload that onto somebody who <laughs> could do it. Um, it's a lot of fun, but you know, uh, very time intensive. We have a ton of farmers around where we are who, would, who don't want to have to drive to Indiana and pay an exorbitant amount per bird. Anyway, um, the idea that, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, if a school wants to buy a number 10 can of Kentucky grown tomatoes, can they do that? Mm, number 10 can. Fresh tomatoes, yes, but not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the infrastructure for preserving fruits and vegetables, to your point, um, basically doesn't exist. There are some people doing it very small and, you know, community kitchens, things like that. If farmers could sell to a regional processor, um, and I won't go so far left as to say a municipally operated processor, but a, a, a processor who could get off the ground at a reasonable rate to aggregate like we've been talking about produce can it make sure that you know if you want to make tomato soup and grilled cheese for the kids in December you can do that right with a Kentucky grown product um, I do have a solution for that <laughs> oh good <laughs> there is somebody going it's not in a can but yeah but yeah Perfect. We've got a couple of them. Um, KHI uh, here in Northern Kentucky mm -hmm. is one uh, that we're really proud of that, that makes products for schools and otherwise with Terrific. local products and then custom food solutions and others in, yeah. at, there in Louisville. Keep right. the mm -hmm. thoughts on infrastructure. Yeah. He's exactly right. Uh, I mean, you know, the consumer demands it, the, the middle infrastructure provides it, and the, and the farmer produces it, and it takes that chain. you got to build that mm -hmm. chain together, you know. Uh, it, 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 it has to be that way because you, you, you can't do the production if you don't have the infrastructure to process it and move it. And you can't do the infrastructure and process and move it unless you've got the customer standing there ready to buy it. Absolutely. Okay? And yeah. so this whole system grows. <laughs> this whole system grows slowly. Well, a lot slower than some of us want to, but mm -hmm. this system grows. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the unique thing about local foods and farm to table is, is that, you know, You've seen this develop. It's created opportunities for people to come back to the farm. It's created opportunities for people to get into restaurants and, and processing, baking, whatever it may be. And so it's really, uh, you know, it, it's really, it's, and I think Kentucky probably is one of the shining spots for this across the nation. It's really, with our Ag Development Board and the, and the emphasis that's been there now for almost 20 years, it's really, it's made a difference. We're, uh, say, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say there's another infrastructure Yes, but also I think education is mm -hmm. so critical. From a restaurant standpoint, I think that's actually my, my primary objective is to, is to help people see what local food can be like. Is I think, uh, I know, I look back at myself 15 years ago, I didn't know what a cucumber looked like on a plant, man. I didn't know that lettuce produced flowers. <laughs> um, I think the majority of Americans are in this space. They don't remember what's happening with the land. They don't remember that you can't get strawberries in March. They don't remember that you can't get tomatoes in June. And so there, there's all this intuitive knowledge that we have to sort of slowly re-educate the people in our communities about. And unfortunately, most restaurants aren't helping because they're serving cucumbers in February. Uh, you can buy bell peppers in a central display at Kroger in the middle of the winter. So we're teaching people to expect things that the land can't do. And so we have to slowly reteach people what eating off this land is like and what that can look like for you and, and have a reasonable expectation. Thank you. Uh, kind of a s speed round here, panelists. Uh, if you feel like this question is uh, tailored to you, uh, just take it. But we're going to move pretty quickly because we just have a few minutes left. Rhonda in Campbell County asks, 
my family has 40 plus acres. How do we decide what to grow? And how do we connect with uh, someone to guide us in the process? Um, it depends on what the soil's like. So, yeah. so that's, that's that. Answer. Please, yeah, let's start with that. Um, extension, I think, would be a yeah, really great, great um, step. next step. Uh, it's complicated, but but please do use it and and work with, bring on other farms to, to or farmers to, to farm that land too. And I yeah. would say start small. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. plant all 40 acres at one time. Mm -hmm. Start small. Try a few things. See what it works mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Take your time. Okay. If you, you thought that question was, was oh, go ahead. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke. You don't need the six-wheel combine on 40 acres. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't let them tell you that in the equipment shop. <laughs> All right. Uh, but if you think that question was complicated, uh, uh, the, our forum just is going to need to extend till midnight with <laughs> Tyler Owen's question, uh, what practical steps can we uh, be taking to eliminate food deserts through local food economies? <sighs> <laughs> I got I got one. Um, I've been sort of following the progress of the um, uh, cooperative grocery movement in Louisville right now. Um, I think cooperatives in general are there's a huge huge opportunity kind of in that space. Um, realistically, like people are just going to have to come or come together around this. There's not there isn't capital investment ready and waiting to open a grocery store in places that are underserved in that way. And I mean, like technically, I live in one. We have a great grocery store in Campbellsburg. That's eight miles from my house. If I didn't have a car, I wouldn't be able to get there. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, realistically, that's going to have to be people coming together to, to open up spaces like that. Um, I could answer. Um, we have in Fort Thomas, there's not actually a grocery store. And um, one of the things that has been really cool is there is a convenience store located centrally in town. And he's expanded his um, location recently. And he has been connect communicating with the farmers at the farmer's market to say, how can, how can you drop off produce when you come in to market? And then that's available to the community for the rest of the time. So it I don't think it has to be something really big. It could be. Oh, sure, sure. Um, but I think it also it's just out of the box thinking which this community is really phenomenal at doing um, and so that has just been a really cool thing to watch um, kind of evolve you know start with a few things and then see what else where it takes it but I think that um, that out of the box thinking is really really great oh in California we had urban farms uh, they would have a, a blighted um, property um, they would clear it and they would plant it and it became a, a community volunteer site so everyone in the neighborhood would sign up they would grow produce and they would pretty much give it away um, so taking like neglected just individual plots it didn't have to be big and these were all around like the one in every neighborhood they were just called urban farms I was going to refer people to Queen, I think it's Queen Mother's Market, excuse me if I'm mixing up the name, uh, in, uh, Walnut Hills has started to try to solve that, and then I think it's called Gem City in Dayton. So there are some local um, people who have really focused in on, on that problem and use local food to, to help. We're about out of time, but I'm going to do one more question uh, from uh, Kara, who is a student at the UC's uh, design school. And her question, I, the design school, of course, teaches sustainable architecture. Kara, I don't know if that's your field or not, but I'm not surprised, uh, uh, given the uh, school, that you're, this is the question. Sustainability in agriculture is uh, crucial moving forward. However, my biggest critique uh, is that sustainability is a luxury. It takes a lot of money and knowledge to live sustainably. How can we make this uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable agriculture accessible to everyone without uh, devaluing the food or the farmer? That's a really good question. I think it's important to remember that farm to table is not new. It's important to remember that this is the way that humanity's existed since the beginning of time, and we're rediscovering something that's old. Um, so it's not really ultimately a bourgeois thing. It's, it's, the, it's the right of all people. All animals love farm to table, it's just what they do. So I think at the core of it is we have to remember that this is not a new thing, it's an ancient thing. Um, and I, I know something that Alice Waters, who I said is one of my mentors, uh, Victory Gardens. People's front yard, pull up the grass, plant crops. Something that everybody can do that's, that's very uh, potentially attainable. But that's a really great point. Well, thank you, and I ask you all to join me in thanking our panel, weren't they great? <laughs> uh, uh, they may not r rush off, so if you want to interact, and uh, you have their websites, uh, so 
Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for being with us and for bringing the forum back live. Uh, and we'll see you again. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.